So welcome everybody. This is another webinar in our webinar series for the Instructional Design and Learning SIG. Today we are delighted that we have Felice Banner. Um, we first got in touch with her about doing the webinar right after the summit because she had such a successful gamification program at the summit and we asked, can you do something for us as a webinar? And I was super excited jumping up and down when I got the email that said, sure. I would love to. So I've known Felice for a couple of years. Um, she is a marvelous cornucopia of skills. Not only is she very, very good at understanding and communicating to us the principles of instructional design, but she is a cool person and very generous. Um, Felice frequently runs the um, remote attendance at the summits. Um, she does a lot of speaking. She does a lot of writing. Um, you can see her marvelous portfolio and get in touch with her at Felice Manor, is it dot net or dot com? Dot com. Dot com. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Felice and everybody buckle up because this is going to be an exciting ride. <laughs> Thanks, Vicki. So hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, Felice Banner here. And I'm, deli I'm actually delighted to be here and would have been here sooner if I was paying attention to my emails and, and saw that the series is going on. And I really appreciate all the work that the SIG does. Uh, I hope to become more involved in the SIG. I have, um, I've been, I'm just go right ahead, dive right in here. Um, I have been designing for a, a very long time. And I want to, I had many different roles, and I love this notion that I have a cornucopia. I consider myself a, a jack of all trades and master of some. And the design work that I've been doing in in the early days, in the 80s and the 90s, was um, all in uh, data visualization. So I had two undergraduate degrees, one in graphic design and the other in data visualization. And actually, before I go any further, um, if at any point in time you want to interrupt me and ask a question, go ahead and type in the chat, I have a question for Felice, and Vicki will interrupt me. Because if we were in, you know, face-to-face, -face, I'd ask you to just raise your hand, just jump up and shout. Anytime you have a question while I'm going through, please feel free to interrupt me. I want to keep it informal and, and, um, and just jump right in. So back to my history, I've been designing for a very long time. I worked in data visualization and I transferred over to higher ed in, um, in, the, in the late 90s, doing instructional design um, and uh, helping faculty basically translate their courses into, online, into the online space. Along the way, all of the design work that I've done, um, you know, I have a, I have, under two undergraduate degrees, I have graduate degrees, I, I have, you know, certifications, I have training, I have experience, you know, everything that I've been doing for all of these years, um, I've really been collecting toolkits, approaches, research theory, just throwing everything to, I wish like throw something into my backpack and, and build my own approach to, to the design process. And, after all of these years, so, you know, from the early 80s until now, there was still something missing from my toolkit. And I didn't realize it until I saw it. So I want to talk about that experience of, um, of what I found, what I added to my toolkit, and then walk you through um, exactly what this uh, learning environment modeling is. When we talk about design, and as a designer, how many of you, just let me know in the chat or yell it on the phone, how many of you have designed something at some point in time? Yes, right? We all have. Great. And typically, we're given a goal, and this design process gets us to the solution. And even if we follow uh, a set design framework like Addy or um, or any, you know, rapid design, anything, any, even if you set a, use, follow a structured design framework, something that you have, you bring something to it yourself, and you are, are part of getting from one place to the other. That's your, as a designer, that's your role. 
But instead of that straight line, I've never had that straight line happen. I don't know about you. Instead of that, from go, going from that goal to the solution, we end up with things in the way, right? Things get in the way, whether people are confused about what we're trying to communicate, the, our stakeholders are frustrated with um, our translation of what our subject matter experts are trying to get across. There's some lack of communication. There's lack of direction. All of these things get in the way of getting from that one place to the next, getting from a goal to a solution. Um, and what I found is that there's a lack of shared design language. And whether you come from, you know, the School of Visual Arts or Parsons and coming from, you know, the Bauhaus School of Design and having a, a really great foundation in what graphic design is, moving through learning about UX, user experience design, transitioning to instructional design, getting into uh, learning experience design, there's always, there's a lack of a shared design language, right? And also, a lot of time when we're asked to design, we are given these invisible design practices. We not given, we create invisible design practices. What I do is my secret sauce. It really is. I'm really good at what I do, but it's this invisible practice. No one sees it. And I, you know, it's what we're left with is this ineffective design communication. Now, my question is. Can a good designer thrive within a culture of ineffective design communication? What do you all think? Yes, no, maybe, can you? Anyone? What do you think? Yeah. Can you, can you yeah. see the, yeah, you can see the chat window, right? I can, yes. So, and it does depend on the person. But yes, a good designer can thrive within that culture. I've been doing it for years, right? And we come up with workarounds because of this. And each one of us has a different type of workaround, whether it's being able to communicate very well what your concepts are, whether it's in writing, whether it's verbally, whether it's visually. We can, but it's really hard. And it's inconsistent, right? And so the biggest frustrations I ha have, I couldn't put my finger on. But then, I met Bucky Dodd. This is Bucky Dodd from uh, University of Oklahoma. I love this man. And it was a, a chance meeting at a conference where I walked by a table, and out on the table was this sign, Learning Environment Modeling. And on the table, they had some Post-it notes. And the Post-it notes had little drawings on them. And suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm one for, for post-it notes. I'm one for tools. It's like, what are they giving away for free over there? And I went over, and I talked to Bucky Dodd, and he blew my mind. In 10 minutes, reshaped the way I approach the work that I do. And this is, you know, I have been working in the design industry for close to 40 years, right? That's, look, 35 years. That's a long time, right? I'm set in my ways. I think I'm really good at what I do. And you blew me away and gave me the tools that I needed. It gave me a design language. So what I want to share with you today, just like Kelly says in the chat, I think you need a shared vocabulary. I want to give you the shared vocabulary, the way I learned it, the tools that I have from um, from learning environment modeling and talk about ways that it's helping me work with all of these people. It helps me work with my SMEs, with my subject matter experts, every client, my students, my faculty, any, any, you know, it's working in academia for me, it's working in corporate for me. It's giving me a shared language. And that language, that shared vocabulary, that language, the learning environment modeling language is made up of these parts. It comes down to being as simple as this. These were the post-it notes that I saw out on the desk. Five symbols indicating information, dialogue, feedback, practice, and evidence. The entire language comes together as a visual model. And I want to show you what it looks like in practice and then go through each piece, each component of this language, each element of this language, and then show you how to use it. So in a visual model, 
right? And using these little elements, this is what it ends up looking like. So what do you see here? Tell me what you see here before I even talk about or explain to you what this is. And don't read what John Gilmore wrote at the bottom. <laughs> Tell me what you see, anybody. Come on the phone. I'll call on you if you don't. Vicki, what do you see? Okay, so what I see um, looks like they're categorized by shape, right? And color. And there's a flow. And some things appear similar. It's divided into chapters. Is that right? What am okay. I supposed to be seeing? No. No, no, that's all. I want to hear what you think you see, okay? So without even knowing what this language is, you sort of have an idea of what this might be, right? It started like this on a, on a board, working through the board, right? Ended up like this. What I want to do is take you through each part of this language and the simplicity of this language. And then I want you to think about, and thanks for sharing in the chat, Lori says the diagram of the construct of a class is exactly what it is, okay? So I wanna share the parts of the language with you, go over each one, talk about the way we put them together, and then I wanna hear from you how you might be able to use this. So this is it. This is the entire language. It's this simple. Each one of the building blocks across the top, okay, building blocks across the top, We've got modes of delivery and then some, some other actions and objectives. I want to walk through each piece. The building blocks are here. Information, dialogue, feedback, practice, and evidence. Information, that symbol indicates any type of content that you're sharing that's any type of content, whether it's uh, um, you know, a written piece of content, a file that's uploaded, a video that you want your learners to watch, any sort of information. What do you think dialogue is? Anyone? Go ahead, type it in the chat, say it on the phone. What's dialogue? Class discussion. Yep. Input, back and forth, conversation, discussion. Think about dialogue. Dialogue can also be reflection. It also can indicate self-reflection. Okay, dialogue, conversations you're having with someone or with yourself even. Feedback is just that. Feedback, summative, formative feedback. And if you're always unsure about the difference between the summative, formative, and summative, what is the formative feedback is when you're cooking the soup and tasting it, and summative feedback is when the soup is done and you taste it. <laughs> That's the simplest version I've ever I've ever heard. But uh, feedback. The next building block is practice, and practice is how you how you see the learner uh, illustrate that scaffolded learning, right? So as they're going along, have how can they can they show that they're learning, right? So it might be a mini quiz, it might be a, a test project of some sort. And that's different from evidence. Evidence is complete evidence of learning. Practice gets you up there. It's those formative stages. And evidence is that at the end. Can you show that learning has taken place? Do you have any questions about these five simple symbols? Anyone? Is anybody excited yet? <laughs> Maybe a little bit? Good. Everybody? So. It's so easy and it's so helpful. Okay, so Pam's not quite clear on evidence. So um, let's think about uh, if you're, uh, we'll talk about it in a college situation for you, Pam. At the end, uh, you may have students, you may have a, a couple of chapters that are, yeah, we'll just go ahead right here, a couple of chapters on photosynthesis. At the end of that, that, uh, section, it's write an essay, right? So, which is different from practice, because the practice would be, um, you know, a, a little quiz, a mini quiz, this is bigger assessment. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, but uh, with the student providing evidence, because assessment, 
can uh, can also be that quiz. So think in it for each one of these building blocks. See the line at the top and the bottom. The idea is that you would indicate what what that it what it would be. So in this case, I'm saying the evidence is an assay on photosynthesis. The building block itself is in the center, and then how it would be. Uh, how the learners would, would do this. So they're going to use an assignment Dropbox in the learning management system, and you can be as, uh, as um, detailed as assignment Dropbox in the learning management system that will be due on this date. And so this idea of here it is, um, so what it is, the building block itself, and then the how. The next part of the language, the next bunch of elements of the language are context. So is it taking place in the physical classroom? Is it taking place online synchronously, online asynchronously, or experiential? And actually somebody yesterday asked me <laughs> what experiential was. And just imagine, you know, there's there's the military training on driving the Panzer tank where the learners are doing, a, 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 you know, reading through the manual, and then they actually get in the tank to drive the tank. Think about that as being experiential. You have any questions? So the context sort of are boundaries that we'll use to, to put around our um, our building blocks, and then the next core of of the language are actions. Now, this these actions have helped so much in the in the conversations that I've been having with clients, and I'll talk more about that when we talk about this presentation as a whole. As when you put all the pieces together, and as a solid arrow is a learner action. So the learner is going to take look at all the content. The learner is going to, you know, look at information. The learner is going to um, provide evidence. The learner is going to take a quiz and have a practice. The facilitator action is maybe under feedback. Facilitator action, the instructor provides feedback. System action is if the technology is doing something or the system that's supporting this learning is doing something so that it's, um, uh, automatically a badge is awarded, right? Or um, the learner takes a quiz and then suddenly the system puts them on a different pathway for an adaptive learning approach. So that's the difference between these three actions. Then there's notations. The notations are just what are what are the objective? We want to label an objective that would go with any part of this learning space, right? And a start and end point. So it is linear and it works in linear environments. I have I'm playing with it now to work in some sort of hyper media environments as well and pushing it to the limits and it's working. So, um, so these are the components. These are the parts of the language. Any questions on any parts, on the building blocks, the context, the actions, or the notations? Any questions? Yes, no? Does it look simple to you? Because it is. <laughs> it's really simple. Okay, so put into use, it looks something like this, okay? There's a start point and there's some practice to see if a learner can do something, then they, they can go up and uh, look at some content, have feedback, have a conversation. This is how, um, and it is, it is so simple, this is sort of what it looks like in practice. Here's another way it looks in practice, right? So here's some content. We'll start with a video or a story to grab the attention of the learner. We'll talk about the learning outcomes. We'll have a conversation with the discussion board to talk about prior learning. We'll have a multimedia lesson, a practice exercise, and then evidence at the end. Then look, discussion boards, feedback is, is over here at the end. Now, the, when I took a look for the very first time at learning environment modeling, and I saw one of these um, these examples, it so quickly told me that, wait a minute, why are we only having our learners demonstrate their skills at the end? Why isn't there practice at the, in the very beginning? Oh, look, it's really heavy on feedback at the end. Should we put some feedback in the beginning? Because the visual cues are there. And it gives you another way to look at curriculum, to look at the flow of learning, um, you know, from, from a modular perspective, from a content perspective, from a curriculum perspective, to see if it's well balanced. And I loved this visual representation. 
that's just one one reason why I love it. And I want to talk more about um, why it's so valuable to me. I want to talk to you about the, yes, Janice, it is very much so, uh, like agile from learning. I want to talk about the approach. And the, the way that I work with this is I start with the evidence. Right, and it's the same as backward. If you've ever done any backwards learning design, it's you know what is it that we want our learners to be able to do? Here's our change the car tire within the scenario. Okay, demonstrate it right in the right in front of me that you can change that car tire. Starting with adding evidence and then working backwards, then adding the other building blocks. Okay, talk about why it's important to change, to be able to change tire, the parts of the tire, right? the tools you'll need a little activity simulation, more feedback, and, and then getting to that, that point of evidence. So it's starting by adding the building blocks, I mean the evidence, then adding the other building blocks, and then next, add the context. So this is gonna be online, and then this is gonna be in the classroom. You're gonna come in, this is like a flipped classroom right here. Do you all see how, um, it, how it just, now visually you have, you can see what this course is gonna look like? Okay, I'm gonna stop just for a second. Pam says, immediately thinking, I'd like to map it to basic instructional design theory. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So after adding context, then you add the actions, right? This is how my learner's progressing. This is where the instructor's chiming in. This is what the objective is. This is the start point, and this is the end. Oh, I did. I'm gonna step ahead of you. This is the start point, this is the end point, this is how it flows. This is when the instructor comes in, and um, and it, it works, right? It works. You can you can follow it. It's easy to follow. So, I want to talk about my practice when I work with a client, and I'm going to show you actual work, okay? And it's a, a huge project that I'm working on right now for um, the state university system. And so uh, before, I, before I go ahead and show you, after I found Bucky Dodd, after I found learning environment modeling language, and I was just so thrilled with what I saw, I asked if, um, you know, I found out that they had certification. I'm like, I want to be certified. I want to know absolutely everything there is to know about learning environment modeling language. Give me every book. Give me every post-it note you have. I, I need to play with this. And, um, I did go through certification, and I took the pieces from the, their practice and their processes that would work best for me, right? I don't use every component of it, but I'm gonna talk about the different parts of it. And, and now as I show you an actual project that I'm working on, I wanna talk about why and how this has helped me and why I was so thrilled to incorporate this into the work that I'm doing. So when I work with a client, I do a lot of design thinking approaches. I've been doing it for years. I'm glad there's a name for it now. Going to uh, learner personas, then doing learner journey mapping, and then doing um, developing sort of like idealistic environments. What if I work doing what if statements, um, if you want to look that up from this, the design thinking approach. And, um, and so I, then I come up with a mind map. I do a lot of mind mapping, whether you know it's illustrated by hand or whether I'm using a tool, I come up with a mind map. And I created this entire learning hub for the Open Educational Resources uh, learning space with the uh, State University of New York. And the course is over here, it's these practice areas. And so the next step I would do is go into each practice area and break it down into the pieces that I would want to have. Okay, and, and the flow that we would want to have in the course. And then from here, I may do some hand flow diagrams and create some wireframes and then explain what that learner journey is going to be if they come in and work around. But at this point, when I was working with a client, it took so much writing and so much presentation time and so much explaining. And now I do this instead. So this is my newest step. From here, where I've got a court, the understanding OER section of this course, I can now build out using learning environment modeling language. 
And the most important thing that I can do right now that I could never do before is leave the room. And if you've worked in, uh, you know, if you, in those spaces where you've designed something, right, as wonderful as you are as a communicator, as well as you've documented anything out, there are questions, there are, uh, you know, those that, that miscommunication that's taking place. I can leave the room and I can step away. I can grab my ego right out of this design process, put this up in front of folks, and if they understand this language, which took me about 20 minutes to teach this client, that's it, everyone, and 40 stakeholders, and you'll notice that the blue the blue line is different here. Um, I I was trained before they um, they changed the image for information, which I'm glad they did because this I don't like the old symbol, but I did use this old symbol just for the information. Um, and I, I can leave the room now. I can leave my design, and they can say to me. They are so much more informed now that, you know what, we would like to put feedback earlier on. We would like to have actual feedback earlier on. We would like the instructor to be more involved in different places here. So I'd like to stop, take a break, and hear from you. And I highly encourage you to come on the phone, um, come on audio, or let me know in the chat. What are your impressions? What do you see here? How do you see that this could be of value? And Pam, are you willing to come on audio? Sure, sure, I'm here. Um, you know, I, I teach instructional design and I work with, with basic theories, so I was really serious. I'm intrigued by the fact that this is uh, visually mapping the instructional design process. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the fact that it helps you get a bird's eye view of of your goals and your process is really valuable. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's hit everything in the ID process that I need to give more thought to. Um, it intrigues me because I'm teaching visual design right now. Kelly Smith's in here and she's in the class. And then it occurs to me that um, you have to ask yourself the question, would this type of map be beneficial? Otherwise, you could overlook opportunities to use it. So those right. are all the things that are sort of flipping through my mind right now. So there is there is a um, an entire process that's associated with learning environment modeling. And um, I highly encourage you to look into the entire process. I, I'll show you a couple pieces. I've got them in the presentation today. Um, but thank you for sharing. Anyone else out there want to share? I see some folks in the chat. We have a shy and quiet audience here, Vicki. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, because we are very loud. And, um, and I like the good discussions. I also want to backtrack a little bit. We want to make sure that we come back to some of the questions that were in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Make sure you keep note of that, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Shall we read for, for um, people? Because we could just go ahead and read what they have in the chat. So Lynn says, I can see where this would be helpful with the large and small bodies of knowledge that need to be taught. I'm working with a huge body of knowledge that is difficult to wrap your mind around, and it seems like the process, this process would help me with that. Mm -hmm. Kelly Smith says, this is very cool. I don't develop instruction, but I would love to share this with our IT training team. Great. Uh, Susan says it seems to be especially valuable for sharing with stakeholders and uh, subject matter experts. And Susan, this is where it's been most useful to me. And I've been able to share with my 
uh, with my clients easily, with everyone that's in the room. But when it goes up to stakeholders, I spend so much time writing documentation to go along with my design, you know, an executive summary, a more in-depth piece. And putting this in the executive summary makes it so much easier for those high-level stakeholders to, to understand and see, uh, to see how this, this would, uh, this does work. And yes, so Anne, yesterday I was t sh talking about learning environment modeling with a gentleman who works for Miram Learning and their instructional designers are all over the world. So it's even for the instructional design team to coordinate and have a common language. So he, you know, his designers are in uh, Colombia, South America, uh, in um, in Romania, and uh, and I think India also. So they need the instructional design team to have a common language. So it's it's just you know value all over the place. So uh, you know, I I do a lot of work with faculty in faculty developing online courses and transitioning from the classroom to face-to-face -face classroom to, to teaching online. And it's really useful to, you know, get out the, to get them away from a computer, to get them away from a learning management system, to, you know, even in the corporate environment, step away from those uh, tools that might confine the way that you want to teach your learners and address learning and start playing with, these components with the with the post-it notes and drawing things out. And when I've worked with folks to try to get them to draw things and illustrate them, they're like, well, I can't draw, so I'm not going to start drawing up on the board. And it's so simple. These post-it notes just make it so easy for folks to say, okay, I can put this up, and this is what I'm trying to say. And so it's just been so valuable working in either, you know, whiteboarding and or um, working on big you know, giant pieces of paper. So I want to talk about the design framework that I mentioned briefly to Pam, because there is an entire, entire design thinking uh, focused design approach, instructional design and learning environment modeling architecture um, framework to support this language. And with it comes, uh, these help guides and there are six or seven different guides that go into the process and there's an entire process. Now I don't use all of these uh, with my clients. I take, pick and choose the pieces that I, I need that fill the gaps that were in my practice. If you're, even if you're just starting out, if you, you're a seasoned instructional designer, these, the, the, these, these extra tools and, and the process of learning environment modeling that they have as a set process um, at the, the Institute for Learning Environment Modeling is, are, is fantastic. So look at, you know, look at this. What is evidence really asking for? How can people demonstrate what they've learned? How can they practice in, in this learning environment? What opportunities for feedback are there? What opportunities for dialogue? So this helps you ask the types of questions you need to ask. And all of these tools are part of this toolkit, including this notion of a focus board. And the focus board it is, um, is you know, these other tool, as part of this other tool set that lets you work with bring in larger design teams. So when I'm working with, you know, all of the faculty in the School of Engineering and getting them together, you know, we, we talk about all of these pieces together, including the deans, right? What does each class, what are we looking to do with each course? What do we need our learners to be able to do? And then all of these pieces help, um, help focus the conversations that we need to have in support of creating these learning spaces. So this is one group um, of faculty oh. that keep this up all the time, right? And um, creating a workspace and a design space like this is so helpful. It's so helpful. I have a very large um, uh, kitchen wall that's a chalkboard, and I used to always draw on my chalkboard, and now I stick post-it notes up on my chalkboard. I know it seems silly, but it's just been so helpful for me 
in that intermediate step. And I, I don't use all the tools, um, but I do use the modeling language in that intermediate step when I'm trying to go from uh, my mind maps to creating that, uh, that experience and mapping out an experience. And that's where it's been really useful for me. So um, I wanna turn it back over to you. And I know this has been kind of quick with me throwing everything at you, but it's this simple. And I do want to say I had my session accepted for the summit. So if you're at the summit, I'm going to be talking about learning environment modeling, but we're going to be making models in the summit session. Um, I'm going to have a slew of tools with me. I'm going to talk about the entire uh, approach and share all of the resources that I have. And then I can talk also, um, I can ask any questions you have about the Institute for Learning Environment Design and what certification, what the process of certification was and, and how, to, how to access these resources. Well, what I really love is that this is all research-based. It's out, you know, they are, they are so good at what they do and, um, you know, sound, 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 sound practice. Um, how could you, how do you think you would use this? And I did ask this earlier in your practice. Anyone else? So Vicki, because I can call on you. <laughs> Tell me what you think. So I do feel like I have now have a language, um, and it's a visual language for uh, both for sketching out ideas and for doing the planning. Um, I like the simplicity of the sticky notes. So mm -hmm. that uh, th there's been some discussion on where do we get more information in the chat. Thing. Yeah. So, like, do you make your own sticky notes, or do you get them from Buddy and Bucky? And so, this is my. I have to put this slide in here because uh, I will always be grateful <laughs> for their work. Um, and again, whenever when they share and when they teach, it's just oh, they're they're just tremendous, tremendously helpful, brilliant individuals. The two of them. So here's where everything is from. It's the University of Central Oklahoma's Institute for um, Learning Environment Design. It's eyelidsolutions.org. Um, and that's where you can get all of the, yes, Pam, all of the, uh, the resources that they have. You can learn more about becoming a certified learning environment architect. Um, the program is an in-person program. They do uh, are working to do an online cohort. I was their first online independent study <laughs> certified learning environment architect. Uh, but uh, they also do consulting services and production services. They, um, they do this for businesses. They do it for other institutions of higher ed. Pam, do you know about UCO? Do you know the folks there? No, I don't know these folks. That's why I asked there. So very good to know. You, I highly recommend that you explore it. You explore it for working with your students to expose your students to it. You can even, um, I, I am 99% sure that if you ask Bucky or Michael to do a webinar for your students specifically to go, go further in depth, they would do that. Um, Thank and you. Yeah, and if you want me to make that introduction for any of you, if any of you want me to make an introduction for you to the folks at, um, at ILED, I'd be happy to. I'm trying to get them to come to STC in May um, and get a booth so that they can sort of show their wares and explore how to do it and, um, and explore with you. And I'm happy to show anyone um, any, any other resources that are associated with it. It's important to me to share the love <laughs> from the perspective of you know, being a seasoned design professional and, and seeing something that actually I could really, really, really use after all of these years that makes my work so much better and so much easier. And it's all about that communication process and being able to step away from your work. And I think we need to really learn how to do that. And you know, Pam, in your role as, as a faculty member, you can get your students early on. <laughs> Great, excellent. Yeah, I was just typing in. I thought I'd like to give it a, a go myself, either for a consulting uh, job or probably for designing a class. And then it, 
if it works well, you know, we could deliver it to our students. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so in the, when I went through the Certified Learning Environment Architect program, I had to do just that. And it was um, the steps, the exercises that I had to do were all real, you know, based on real world exercises, real clients, real, real challenges. And I was so lucky that I happened upon this right when I had started my contract with SUNY. So I could, with state university system, so I could use this and, and saw how it could work. And when I went through that, um, the, my certification, Bucky and Michael were there, you know, helping me with that design process, saying, what does that really look like? What am I trying to do? So um, there's, uh, you need, what you need to do you know, when when you start playing, and it's good, Pam, that you say you want to try it out. When you start playing and saying, okay, it's, it's simple, it's these tools, you ask yourself questions that you didn't ask before until you got further down the line. So it's like, oh, did I build in enough feedback? You know, being able to step back and say, did I build enough feedback? And what does that really mean? Who's giving that feedback? What's going to happen after the student gets that feedback? Will they have other options? So being able to plot that out like that, um, it gives you it brings problems to light sooner than they used to they used to come to light for me that's that's been my experience anyone else so i uh felice i did want to make sure that we circle back to something pam um pam's going to uh, take this idea further into her work and there is interest in the chat on finding out how that you know, what the results are of uh, Pam's implementation. So, Pam, yeah. can, can I get you to, like, agree to, if you write it, I don't know if you write it up for an academic paper or if you just write it up for our newsletter or if you want to do another webinar, we would love that. We just want yeah, to I would love to hear back from you, Pam. I want to volunteer you for some more work in addition to this work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, no, I'll be happy to share uh, whatever I do with it. Yeah, absolutely. And you all would have the uh, addresses of the folks who are in this webinar, right? I have everybody's email. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I don't have anything more to share, but I'm happy to stay around and answer questions. I would love to, um, to you know, it, in, if you're going to be at the summit, I'd love for you to attend my session so that we can play together. Um, and that's the other piece of it for me. It's more, uh, and you know, I only do what I love to do anyway, <laughs> but this is, um, there's an element of play in here. And play doesn't mean fun, play means play and being able to, you know, have freedom to, to fail. And, you know, these, um, these, uh, just the whole system is great. If uh, there are two books that came along with all of my certification. And I think, I know that they're available on the ILED Solutions site. One is a basic introduction to the concept, and the other one is, um, is one is about learning environment modeling, and the other one is about the learning architect system, the learning environment, being a learning environment architect. And you know that that becoming an architect in that system is really about the process as well, all of those extra uh, ways of. Um, uh, getting to know your learners, you know, the empathy, doing some empathy mapping, uh, doing some ideation and creation, um, iteration, and uh, understanding where those gaps are. And uh, it's just, the whole thing is just, I can't recommend it in, enough. Yeah, I can't. It's just fantastic. Anyone else? Vicki? So I'll make sure that I include this link in the email that will go out after the webinar that has the link to the recording and a link to how to connect with Felice. 
I'll make sure I include this um, iledsolutions.org. Yeah, please do. And thank you all. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I want to share the love <laughs> I want, um, and I know how helpful it can be. So thank you, Pam. <laughs> thank you all. And, and thanks for taking time out of your day to share a learning experience with us. And I'd love to come back and go more in depth into another topic. So thanks for having me. We would love that. I'm going to stop the recording, and um, but everybody stay in the meeting, and we can talk offline.